if anything, more than 20 years of writing has taught me that what you know, understand, and love, you don't abuse. I saw it in action with my father and his broken relationship with alcohol and with his family. It's part of what motivates me to write about wine. I think learning about wine and deepening your appreciation of it is also a route toward moderation. It's why I teach courses online. It's why I write the books. But this is really personal. Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 214. How does deepening your understanding of wine help you maintain a healthy relationship with it? Why do memoirs help us connect with characters even more deeply than fiction? Which moderation tools and techniques can you use when drinking wine? You'll hear those tips and stories in part two of our chat with Jamie Lewis, host of the podcast Consumed. You don't need to have listened to part one from last week first, but I hope you'll go back if you missed it after you finish this one. Now a quick update on my upcoming memoir, Wine Witch on Fire, rising from the ashes of divorce, defamation, and drinking too much. So apparently the great American short story writer Raymond Carver gave readings while holding a red pen. He was still correcting and improving his work even after it was published and he was on tour. (laughs) I resonate with the feeling of never really being done with a book until someone, usually your publisher, yanks it out of your hands. (laughs) If everything weren't done online these days, I know I'd be running after the van, taking the book to the printer, yelling, wait, just one more thing. (laughs) My memoir really ought to be called The Corrections, but Jonathan Franzen already snapped that one up. Here's a review from Nina Garrett, a beta reader from San Diego, California. Quote, Natalie struggles to gain equal footing, and her successes are captivating and engrossing, to say the least. Also, her personal struggles and triumphs gave me added depth and perspectives to the wine industry. So much goes on behind the scenes, both personally and professionally. I was fascinated to learn about many new sides of wine and the wine industry, especially informative for me was her perspective as a woman. I never really thought about the industry being male-dominated, but it really is. My family will be going to Napa in the spring, we go every year, and I'll be tasting and learning about wineries with a whole new frame of reference. I've written down all the wines she mentioned in her book and hoping to find some of them to try. I plan to read her other two books. I'd love to share a bottle with her. Well, thank you, Nina. I'll get the bottle. You bring the glasses. I've posted a link to a blog post called Diary of a Book Launch in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 214. This is also where I share more behind the scenes stories about the journey of taking this memoir from idea to publication. If you want a more intimate insider seat beside me on this journey, please let me know you'd like to become a beta reader and get a sneak peek at this manuscript. Email me at natalie at nataliemclean.com. Okay, on with the show. You ended up writing two books out and one on the way? I do. Yeah, exactly. Sounds like a kid. (laughs) But they are. They're my book babies. (laughs) They are, aren't they? (laughs) Yeah. Well, so your books, the first two, when did those come out? What years did those come out? It's been a while. So Red, White, and Drunk All Over, A Wine Soaked Journey from Grape to Glass was 2006. The yes. hardcover came out, then the paperback was a year later. It's now also an audiobook. Unquenchable, A Tipsy Search for the World's Best Bargain Wines came out in 2011. So I think the paperback was 2012. So it's been a decade. The one I'm working on now is less of a wine book, more of a memoir 
We could talk about that too, if you like. No, let's talk about it. So the title is Wine Witch on Fire. These titles are, (laughs) they're so provocative, of course. Wine Witch on Fire, Rising from the Ashes of Divorce, Depression, and Drinking Too Much. If you are not hooked, (laughs) by the time you've read those whatever 15 words, I mean, that's just an insane title. Ah. Unpack that for me. Yeah, book and a title. That's kind of what we've done with every. So those are titles and subtitles for those listening. So my first two books were wine books. They were first person, but they weren't really memoirs. So I love to do what I call day in the life. And you're very familiar with this, Jamie, but it's instead of interviewing a sommelier, go be a sommelier in a fancy five-star French restaurant and write about the experience. Instead of Tips, I mean, I do both, but instead of tips for how to buy wine, go work in a wine retail store and try to derive a richer experience. It's part of what the new journalist did. Truman Capote, Joan Didion, George Plimpton was perhaps less well-known, but he played a year, I think, in the NFL league. I guess he was talented oh enough to do gosh. it. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, and he wrote a memoir based on what it's like to be in the NFL league. So he yeah. was pretty serious on his deep dive. So those books were very much like that, Day in the Life. And I had some wonderful experiences. I went all around the world doing this sort of thing. I worked the harvest with Randall Graham at Bonnie Dune in California, Paso Robles. And Mm -hmm. he is a wit, as you know. And so it made for a great story. He's already a great story. But I thought if I could work the harvest with him, I think it might be even better. And it was wonderful. But this book is, wine is more of a prop than the focus. So it's about my worst vintage, 2012. <laughs> oh, and, that's a great way to say it. Oh, yeah. Oh, I could <gasps> keep up with these puns. I decant my, yeah. Nah. Okay. I can't resist a good pun or a bad pun either. So as you might gather from the title, Wine Witch on Fire, Rising from the Ashes of Divorce, Depression, and Drinking Too Much, it's not quite as cheery as the first two books, but I still incorporate humor into what are darker subjects. And I think, if anything, more than 20 years of writing has taught me that what you know, understand, and love, you don't abuse. I saw it in action with my father and his broken relationship with alcohol and with his family. It's part of what motivates me to write about wine, you know, although my relatives think it's rather humorous. I think learning about wine and deepening your appreciation of it is also a route toward moderation. It's why I teach courses online. It's why I write the books and so on. But this is really personal. This memoir is really opening up about, it's not an autobiography. It's a memoir, meaning one slice of life, one year, the worst year, which makes for the best stories, I guess, in the end, but not at the time. So it's interesting because memoir draws on all of these techniques that you find in fiction. So there's a narrator. The people in the memoir are meant to be characters. They're real. The story is true, but you're using the techniques of fiction, which is bizarre and fascinating because you've got to flesh them out. Like, you know, the characters, the people in your life, you know them, but the reader doesn't. So they have to be lifelike. They have to have flaws and good attributes and all the rest of it. No one can be the villain or the saint. And as I tell my partner, Miles, now, I said to him about a month ago, you're becoming a fully fleshed out character in my life. And he just looked at me. Congratulations. You're just so weird. (laughs) I said, I know. (laughs) And you have to start thinking of yourself as the narrator, which causes this sort of -of out-of-body experience sometimes. But it's only through the lens of time and pulling back and seeing yourself as a character that you can actually write with any sort of balance and reflection. One of my favorite memoirs is Glennon Doyle, who wrote books like Untamed and so on. And she says, don't write from an open wound, write from a scar. Because the person coming to the book, the reader, wants to see how your story resonates with their story. Otherwise, unless you're someone's celebrity your story is not that interesting. It's what can the reader learn from your story? Where are the parts where they go, oh my God, I felt that way too. I may not have gone through exactly a divorce or depression, although a lot of people have, 
but they'll say, oh my God, I felt like the world fell out on me too. And then so, you know, again, putting those feelings into words and then taking a step further, how did I deal with it? Maybe there's some clues. It's not meant to be a self-help book, but I think connection and finding the words can be a means of self-help. So I'm getting really long-winded here. You jump in. (laughs) Oh, it's wonderful. Well, so many thoughts. I mean, one is just that I agree with you. Memoir often for me as the reader reading other people's memoir is totally therapeutic. And I have read Glennon Doyle. She actually, personally, I haven't enjoyed her most recent stuff as much as Carry On Warrior, her first book, which is, is she started as a blogger, which, you know, I think we forget that now. So many of the people we read now and enjoy and have become personalities who are, you know, have podcasts and shows and all that. They started as bloggers, which is pretty cool. She wrote one essay on her old blog about being in the line at Target with a small child. Maybe it was a couple of her kids. And one of them was, I think, freaking out a little bit, having a moment. And this older woman said, something like, it goes so fast, treasure it now. And so many people would write about how, you know, it's true. I really do need to treasure it now. Glennon said, absolutely not. I am not treasuring it right now. This is super hard. And she, like you said, she wrote from a scar point of view, I think, rather than from inside the trauma, let the time pass. Because the reason memoir works when it does work, if I could be so bold to define this, I think is when you're outside the trauma, you can derive meaning from like, what does this mean for me? How did this change me? Otherwise, it's just maybe whining or complaining. You have to get to a point where the reader feels like they are benefiting from the writing. And when they do, and when it all lines up, when the audience and the author really interface, that's such magic. And I speak that from being a reader. Not everybody is this way, but for me, books are the things that have more than anything changed my life. They have turned me around at times. And I mean, that's not the case for a lot of people. Maybe it's therapy or maybe it's like a 12-step program or maybe it's having a deep, deep friendship or relationship with a parent. For me, it's totally been reading books. I mean, I have many favorites that are like friends that I come back to. Exactly. I love that you said friends. And you know, for me, what memoir does, like I still love literature, but I don't read as much of it as I did when I was little, whether it was my mom reading to me or when I started reading on my own, but like Narnia and Lord of the Rings and Wizard of Oz. But when we get to the end of the book, I was kind of sad because I felt like I'd lost a friend. Whereas with memoir, I feel like I can keep in touch with the character or friend I've gotten to know because I can follow them on social media or I can take a course or you know, stalk them, but not in a creepy way, but. Well, they invite it much of the time, you know. (laughs) That's true. That's true. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And I get to see how they're living the lessons they learned in the memoir. So I still can see, is there something that I can still apply to my life or, you know, just, it's interesting to see them living out in the world, that character that you got to know so well, and then continuing on with them through their next book or whatever, And I find just to rope it back to, there's some similarities with wine. So, you know, that first Brunello I had, I'll I'll probably never have that exact same experience, but I can buy either that wine or another vintage and try to spark those memory neurons, dendrites, and see if I can get back there as closely as I can. So I can kind of stay in touch with wine that way too. And those experiences. Yeah. So part of the title for this new book is, by the way, when are you planning to have it release? Sure. So I'm going to be traditionally published, which means like it's not self-published or hybrid. It's with a traditional publisher. And the lead times in book publishing are always so long, but May 9th, 2023. And I'm very excited. I just was told my pub date today. They emailed me and I'm so excited. But, you know, yeah, it'll be a long journey, but... (laughs) I mean, it's, I know. It's, it's already starting. It is starting, totally. Well, so in that title, can you tell me if you're comfortable telling me a little bit about the depression part of it? 
Absolutely. So depression runs in my family, and it's probably why alcoholism does too, because my family and I have tried to medicate our way, self-medicate our way out of depression. But as you know, Jamie, it's a short-term fix. Alcohol is actually a depressant. So I think there's a genetic component that's very strong. There's a personality predisposition, you know, the things that I joke about, whether it's perfectionism or competitiveness, there's a desire there that says, I'm not good enough. And there's a resulting sadness or depression that comes with that. I mean, I've been in therapy for years and I'll continue to be, I think therapy is excellent. It's a really good thing. And there are a number of therapy sessions in the book that I find that I hope readers will find of interest. I'm also a believer in taking drugs if your brain chemistry is not right. And I'm on Zoloft. So it's an antidepressant or a serotonin uptake inhibitor. And then, you know, moderation. I've had to learn a lot of techniques for moderation because I love wine so much. I don't want to give up on it. And yeah, I considered Alcoholics Anonymous and that works for some people. But that wasn't my thing. And I don't think I, in all truthfulness with myself, ever got to the point that I felt I was an alcoholic. But I have done lots of techniques. So from, you know, I'll open a bottle and I'll pour right away half of it into a clean, empty, open half bottle so that I don't feel like I have to finish it or it's going to go bad. Or, you know, I've discovered all kinds of preservation techniques for wine from repour, which scavenges oxygen. I can send you links to these. I'm not on commission for any of it. <laughs> to, I love it. Yeah, to the preserve spray that puts, what is it, nitrous oxide or whatever. It gets out the oxygen in the bottle, all kinds of things, to special tops for bubbly and so on. This is great. Those tips, I mean, that's like money in the bank for me. Those oh, are good. really, really valuable, not just for those of us who Maybe have to watch. I mean, I'm also on Zoloft. Ah. We should have a group of wine writers on Zoloft. I mean, we could <laughs> really get this thing going. It would, yes. There's so many people, and I'm glad so you said many. it because there shouldn't be a stigma, yet I think there still is. So, yeah. And I will say, I mean, it has changed my life. I even get yes. kind of choked up thinking about how yeah. I felt like. The water was up at my forehead. Yes. And I could not get my nose above water. Oh, good way to put it. Or a friend of mine who's a therapist, I actually really love this. She said, the best thing for somebody who's really in deep, who's down in a deep, dark hole, the best thing for them is be a combination of therapy and medication. And here's why. I can give you therapy all day long, but if you're in that deep, dark hole, you're banging up against the wall of this hole. If you do some kind of medication that lifts you up to ground level and then therapy, you can walk forward. Ah, love so you that. Can, it's really instructive, I think, and I found it to be really true. For the right person, if you really cannot get your nose above water, it really is helpful. And I've come to a point now where at first I thought, well, maybe this is a temporary thing and I can get over it. But the person who prescribed it to me said, and this is a little bit daunting, but she said, if you have major depressive disorder, which means it's chronic, you have a 100% chance of relapse if you go off your medication. Wow. That's good to know. It's like a wake up call for me that if I had diabetes or if I Mm -hmm. had high blood pressure, I would take my Lipitor, I would take my insulin, no problem. And And I would say to myself, this is forever. Yeah, it's kind of sad. I'd maybe grieve it a bit. And then I'd move on. With this, I really did have to tell myself, you know, this is forever as far as I'm concerned. And that's okay. And like, move on. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I even say to friends or whatever, if you broke your arm, you'd have a cast and no one would say, oh, can't you just let that mend on its own. Like you're so weak or whatever. It's like, no, but we associate these physical things. Even heart disease doesn't have the stigma as mental illness or depression in trying to fix it. There's a chemical imbalance. And, you know, I've come to the resolution that I'll be on it forever too, because while I was traveling and I forgot to take one. And the next day I thought, why do I feel like I'm coming 
undone. Like there's not undone, but just this general, something's not right. Something's not right. And then I remembered, oh my God, I forgot to take it. And, you know, there's so many misconceptions, but for me, Zoloft doesn't make me happy. It just unties the knot. Yes. Yeah. It's not like some sort of Prozac Valium, Valium. Yeah. Not that there's anything wrong with those, but it's not to make you like fake happy all the time. It's like, there's yeah. a knot here and can we just release it so that I can live? And it's also not to like numb you out where you have no personality. I've been told that when you find the right medication, you just feel like you. Yes. You just feel like you. And that was exactly. definitely the case. It almost made me more myself than I had been before I exactly. went on it. So if yeah. anybody is listening and they are kind of medication curious on this or feeling like that resonates, I mean, I would just seriously consider going to your primary care doctor or your yes. find a good psychiatrist and get referrals and just start having a conversation about it. Absolutely. Because, you know, neither you nor I are doctors or nor are we prescribing anything here, but there are so many choices too. I mean, we're definitely not on commission for Zoloft, but <laughs> there's so many different brands that I've heard of Effexor and all kinds yeah. of them. Like Zoloft isn't the only one either. And it, yeah. as you said, it's that fit with your brain chemistry. That's the magic. Yeah. And thank you to all of the scientists and researchers who came up with that, you know, who did the work to find that for us. Okay. So off of depression now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a bit of a downer. <laughs> the listener is like, please, can what, we stop What talking? is this podcast? <laughs> Writing, medication. Oh yeah. Wine a little bit. Food a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, Natalie, actually that does wind up being the case. And I love listening to things like that. I love when it spins out into life. You know, it's yes. not just about food and wine. That's where we begin, but it is. It threads out and I love that. Okay. And that's the job of food and wine is to get to other subjects. And one last thing, Zoloft yes. and other things are also a good guard against leaning on wine too much or any other drug Great that is point. not good for you. So anyway, that is such amen. a good Done. point. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> I want to hear a little bit about, you talked about the fact that you have made your own platform, which I just, you know, I've only done that a tiny, tiny bit and it's so empowering and it's so freeing not to be under the banner. Like nobody's the boss of me basically. And I can come <laughs> up with whatever I want. I got to guest lecture at our local university about podcasting just a couple of days ago. And one of the things that I shared was I don't do a weekly podcast and I know that you do. And I actually would do it if I could, but I got some great advice at the beginning that was, you don't have to do anything. This is not Saturday night live or like Stephen right. Colbert. You decide how often you're going to put it out there and commit to it and do it. And so I said, I would do 10 episodes per quarter which allows me to really batch up my interviews. That's great. And it's been so good. It's been so good for my lifestyle. So I just really respect people who build their own platform. I think that it's the coolest and it's really empowering. But for yours, it looks like you started with writing for publication, but then you also wrote a couple books. And what came after that? Because you have so much now. So yeah, you're right. I started with like a local food magazine, a few other newspaper articles and so on, then created the website because, I mean, that started organically because people were saying, well, I can't read your article because it's in your city and I'm over here. So I started, you know, emailing them all the articles every time and then I <laughs> needed a central repository and that led to the website and the email newsletter. That was a natural evolution. And then the books came because... I was an editor at Penguin, now oh. Penguin Random House, who emailed me after I had won a James Beard Award. And she said, have you ever thought of writing a book? And I hadn't. So I thought, is this the way you do it? And then I asked my magazine editor at the time. She said, no, you need to get an agent back up. And so I did get an agent. And then we went to different publishers. And I did go with Penguin Random House for the first two books. So the books came next, then mobile apps. So I have apps for iPhone and Android that scan either the front label reader or the back barcode and instantly access tasting notes and scores. And within Canada, the local liquor store stock, like if you're looking for a Cabernet, which stores have it and how far are they from you? But I have a lot of international users and certainly 
many, many in the States because I review a ton of California, Washington, New York, Oregon wines. Let's see what else was there. And then there was the blind courses, then the podcast. So I teach an online course that I love, the Wine Smart course, a full bodied framework to pair, buy, and taste wine like a pro. So that's online. And that's been a wonderful way to connect with wine lovers around the world because we all geek out together. It's mainly based on food pairing. So it attracts both the sommeliers and the foodies, but also those who are pretty new to wine. Like you don't have to be an expert at all. We just really take the deep dive into all kinds of food and wine pairings. That's a lot. Natalie, that is a (laughs) lot. And I forgot you had won a James Beard Award. What was that for specifically? Was it for your column? So the first one was for the first one. (laughs) The first one. You are so badass. I love it. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, I just happened to slip that in. Thanks for setting that up. It's like volleyball (laughs) set. No. Yeah, my first one was for an online article. So I got started that way too, in terms of some of the writing. So I've won four James Beard Awards and one was for magazine writing, one was for online, one was for the newsletter. And the fourth one was for what they call the MFK Fisher Award that they give out at the end of the night, sort of like best picture, I guess. But yes, it is. (laughs) That That was for a magazine article as well. Oh, gosh. Speaking of MFK Fisher, I mean. Love, love, love. Oh, my gosh. A hero of mine best writer ever. I don't even have to qualify it with food. No. I can't even quote her accurately, but she said, when we talk of love, we talk of hunger and connection and everything else. She got that, the whole thing we've been talking about it. Yes, she totally did. And yeah, best writer in general and a memoirist. I mean, that's a great way to study memoir. That is true. Yeah. Yeah. Oh gosh. So great. Because you have so much going on, you really do. How do you take care of yourself? I mean, we talked about the biggies like medication and therapy, but I mean, in terms of like a normal day, if you feel overwhelmed, what would you do to take care of yourself? I am a big walker. I love to go for walks. And if I can get into a bit of nature, like we're not near a forest, but we're near a lake and there's some trees. There's that term that people use these days, forest bathing, but I think it's good for your soul to get near nature. I've never heard that. That is so great. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's something about it. Like I've heard, I don't know the whole science, but bodies of water have negative ions, which are actually positive for us. So there's something there in the air, even with water, but also forests or trees or just nature that is restorative to our biology. But also walking. Evolutionarily, we are walkers. And the limbic system calms down when it's in motion. So the whole, you know, you rock a baby, but you're kind of rocking yourself when you're walking. And it's often when my best ideas come to me, but it's also the way I calm down is just to that rocking motion of walking and going somewhere and just changing the energy. We we sit at our desks so long, whether we're writers or a lot of other professions that we need to get mobile again. We were made to walk. So I love doing that. I do every day. I do too. I got hooked on walking when I was in, I studied architecture history in Italy by myself for a summer at one time. And by study, it just meant like I went to different buildings and experienced them for myself because all I had been doing at that point was so abstract writing about them and reading about them. It was a wonderful grant that I received but I went on my own. And because I had a very limited budget, I couldn't always sit at a cafe and journal. So I had to kind of be mobile all the time. I couldn't afford to sit down. And in Europe, a lot of the time when you sit down, it costs money. So (laughs) even on beaches and things like that, you know, you're paying for your space. And that was always a big splurge. You know, you sip it, you get out of there. I was walking all summer long. (laughs) And I completely, I mean, just, I guess, empirically experienced what you're talking about, where the limbic system calms. It's also just a great way to use your body in a low impact way. Yes, exactly. It's not going to damage you, generally speaking. 
and you get to see things. And you, in my town, I see people I know all over the place. You stop for conversation, you pick up a copy, you, you know, it's just, it's awesome. So I'm a big walker too. I love yeah, that. That's true. The interactions are good too. And as an introvert, I like micro interactions. So I'm not committing to sitting down for dinner with somebody, although I do like doing that. But, you know, just the people you see, it gets you out of your head and either just saying hi or a short conversation with someone who's at the end of their driveway. Oh, looks like you're raking leaves or whatever. And you just keep going. But there's something there too that's good, even if you do tend to be more introverted. Well, I wasn't going to ask you any more questions, but since you mentioned introversion, how do you define that for yourself? For me, there's a difference between introversion and shyness, although I think I'm both. Introversion is I like to process information, experiences, and everything else internally. Whereas Miles, my partner, I believe is an extrovert. He likes to talk it out. So that works most of the time. So like if I go to a gathering or book reading or an event, afterwards, I kind of have to retreat to the hotel room or my bedroom or something and recharge the battery. Whereas an extrovert to me, that they'd be riding on a high, like that would have charged their battery just being at the event. Shyness to me is a, a skill that can be, or it could be a predisposition, I'm no expert, but I think it can be overcome in that you can develop skills, whether it's speaking skills or interview skills or whatever it is, but your natural inclination is not to speak up. Whereas introversion to me is how you process an experience or information. That seems to be the difference. But what do you think? I mean, you see me, I'm like nodding like crazy. We have so much in common. At a party, I will be the life of the party. I will be obnoxiously <laughs> the life of the party. I will scooch around. I'll talk to everybody, I'll crack jokes, be loud. The moment I leave, I am so depleted. Mm. It's like, I don't know why. It's it's the only way I can turn that off. Yeah. And I do value so much my deep conversations with people like this one. I mean, I really do get so much from connecting with someone through conversation. But I won't really digest it until we turn this off and I go and like, you know, peel apples for applesauce or something. That's where in a little task, that's where yes. I will, I think it's also where I will derive meaning from what we talk about. I will be able to apply it to my, I guess, apply it to my memory almost too, you mm -hmm. know, to be able to really cement it as something that I remember. But introversion, I mean, it's interesting because I can be so gregarious yep. and know everybody in town. And then my husband is really quiet and has been accused of being aloof in party situations. The interesting thing is he is having the time of his life when he's <laughs> with people. And uh. when we have a good, positive social interaction, when we leave that party, he is on a high. He wow. really gets, but you don't know it by looking at him, same as you can't tell by looking at me that I'm like Interesting. Wow. skittering off the edge. So- <laughs> But, you know, for people like us also, don't you find that there's a threat of isolation too, where you can yes. feel it when it's getting, you are too isolated. It's time yes. to be with people. It is. And, you know, during the pandemic, there were a couple of days when I didn't go outside because it was so cold or, you know, I just did not want to go to the grocery store, but it really can have an impact. And that is part of taking care of yourself. If you tend toward introversion is I used to tell myself for the longest time, I just don't like people. I, I, they just drain me, but I need some of it. You know, apart from my closest relationships, I do need to get out there because I do notice my energy changes. Doesn't mean I need to go to a party out there, but I need to have what I call some micro transactions or conversations yes. with people just to get me out of my head and change the energy. Yes. Yes. That's good medicine in its way too. Yeah. Well, so I ask everybody on this podcast, if it were your last day on earth, let's say you knew you would die tomorrow and you're like, you know what? It's been a good run. I've done, I mean, you're so accomplished and it sounds like you've really found your way through a lot of interpersonal things. If you were like, you know what? It's been really good. I want to celebrate 
what would you eat and what would you drink and who would be there? And it can be anybody living dead and it can be any food, not just the stuff that's available at your local grocery store. (laughs) Sure. I definitely have a banquet, a dinner party with my closest people, my mom, my partner, my son, some family members, some friends. And if I could invite dead people too, then MFK Fisher is welcome. Yes, Jamie, I'd like to have you there because I, know, I think we could pick up this conversation. <laughs> if you're saying oh. MFK Fisher's going to be there, I think oh, I like need to... to be invited. Yes. Do you want to sit beside her or cross? <laughs> I, think, I don't know. Which is the best conversation dynamic? Anyway. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so definitely it would be a dinner. And since cost would be no object because this is the last day, right? I'd be springing for the good stuff for everybody. No decoy wines that I yeah. can put out when I'm being snobby. So I put out uh, Domaine Romani Conti, the pinnacle mm, of DRC. Burgundy and Pinot Noir. Mm-hmm. And we drink it from a good year. And because I'm a wine first kind of gal, you know, the food is harder for me to come up with. So I would probably do something unconventional like my grandmother's homemade biscuits. Oh. And they'd either be, well, this wouldn't go with the wine at all, but with strawberry shortcake, or they'd be out of the oven warm and just slathered with melting butter. butter. I think that would go with the burgundy, the maybe the Pinot Noir. I don't know. I don't care. I would it doesn't matter still at that have point. them. Yeah. 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 So I would eat a lot of biscuits and drink a lot of burgundy. Burgundy and biscuits. Finish it off. <laughs> that is a fine pairing right there. Biscuits. I had biscuits a couple of days ago from a restaurant and they had apple butter on them. And I oh. thought I was dying. It was so good. Biscuits, <laughs> yes, man. Please. I forget how good they are. Oh. Yeah. Natalie McLean, you are so good at this. I mean, for oh, being Jamie. an introvert, you're so good you. at defining what life is for you right now. Oh, and wine well, is a great lens for that. It is. And I love the questions you asked, Jamie. There's just a lot of resonance. We have to get together in person, please. Like, please, you know. Yes, I don't know. I've, I've always wanted out. to see Ottawa. How come? Yes, up? come up in the summer for yeah. sure. Or you're in a beautiful part of California, so you can come here. Yeah, definitely something or some conference or something. But anyway, let's not wait till the last day on Earth, though. No, please. Thank you so <laughs> much for joining me on this special episode. Oh, thank you, Jamie. Bye for now. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed my chat with Jamie. In the show notes, you'll find my email contact, the full transcript of my conversation with her, links to Jamie's website and podcast, and where you can find the live stream video version of these conversations on Facebook and YouTube Live every Wednesday at 7 p.m. You'll also find a link to my free ultimate guide to food and wine pairing. That's all in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 214. Email me if you have a sip, tip, question, or would like to be a beta reader of my new memoir at natalie at nataliemclean.com. If you missed episode 105, go back and take a listen. I chat about festive wine and cheese pairings with Janet Fletcher. I'll share a short clip with you now to whet your appetite. There are lots of similarities. You know, to me, one of the biggest ones is that cheesemakers, like winemakers, start with the simplest palette of ingredients. They have milk yeah. and they have cultures and they have rennet, just yeah. like winemakers have grapes and yeast. Great juice, fresh liquids yeah. that are going and, to be and fermented. Then yep. What gives us such a range of taste experiences in the cheese world or the wine world are the decisions that the producer makes along the way to take it in one direction or another. And of course, with wine, there's a little more of that place element that comes into play, a little bit less so with most cheeses. But with cheese, it's more that the cheesemaker makes a million little decisions all along the way in that recipe that takes milk and cultures and a little bit of rennet and makes so many different kinds of cheese. If you liked this episode, please email or tell one friend about it this week, especially someone you know who'd be interested in the wines, tips, and stories we shared. You won't want to miss next week when I chat about California wines with Chuck Kramer, host of the podcast On the Road with Mr. C.A. Wine. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week, perhaps a wine that deepened your appreciation for all wine. You 
don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemcclain.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.